We ready? Okay. So here's my song, Jerome. I think there's a shock value when you come to Jerome. You know, there's only four or 500 people that still live here. But at one point, you know, it was 10, 15,000 people living on the side of this mountain. We can drive, drive until we run down the road. Founded in 1876, Jerome was once the fourth largest city in the Arizona Territory. It started as a mining camp and grew from a settlement of tents to a thriving community of commerce. I think Jerome has a European feel. If you ever spend any time in, in Italy or, or France, you have these great little communities. You're know, like, how did they get up there on the side of that mountain? And if you're afraid of heights, that first drive over Mingus Mountain will catch your attention. Jerome sits near the top of Cleopatra Hill, overlooking the Verde Valley. The town itself is a national historic landmark. Below the hill is what was once the largest copper mine in Arizona producing a staggering three million pounds of copper a month. That wealth belonged to James S. Douglas, who owned the Little Daisy Mine. In fact, the first prominent building you see as you drive up the winding road to Jerome is the Douglas Mansion, a testament to his copper empire. Then Jerome becomes this ghost town because all 15,000 people move and you have all these empty buildings. And then the hippies kind of take over they, that generation and the bikers and, and it really became an artist community, right? So you get this fun bohemian feel. Live our lives in a little town, stay a while, maybe settle down. Historic buildings like the Flatiron greet you as you drive in. Further up on Hull Avenue is another popular attraction, the Sliding Jail. The concrete cell block was once part of a wood and tin building, but pulled away from the rest of the structure after an underground blast shifted the ground beneath. It slid down the hill, stopping 200 feet from where it started. You'll see historical markers on buildings all over town. Some even have the dates they were built carved into the brick. We can live in a mountain home, maybe move to it has to be one of the most authentic towns, right? We don't have a franchise. There is no corporate America here. It's the way the world should be. It's, it's a little microcosm of how the world could be, I think. Authentic and colorful, maybe even haunted. We are about to rediscover Jerome's past and see how it's helping to not only shape, but shake things up today. Welcome to Nellie Bly, world's largest collection of kaleidoscopes, Jerome, Arizona. This shop on Main Street will give you a totally different point of view. Most of the customers say it's the coolest store they've ever been in, and that includes a lot of world travelers. Brilliant, colorful designs change to form new, intricate patterns with each twist and turn of the scope. That's how the mirrors are set. So if you have an equilateral triangle, you end up with a mandala at the end. If you tighten the triangle, you get more striations in it, making it more interesting. Some people use more than three mirrors, so if it's a two-mirror kaleidoscope, you have the mandala. If it's a three-mirror, it kind of fills the whole screen. If they do it, they can make square patterns by doing a 45-45, 90-degree angle of the mirrors, and it just changes everything. Mary opened the store, well, because she has a fascination for kaleidoscopes. Owner Mary Wills discovered her first kaleidoscope at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Her shop now features incredibly unique designs by hundreds of wood, metal, and glass artisans. But Nellie Bly isn't just a stop, it's an experience. They can come in and handle everything, whether it's a $20 scope or a $20,000 scope. The most expensive scope is called Pegascoptilus. It weighs 40 pounds. It's got a lot of moving parts. It's steampunk. It's $26,000. It was a collaboration of four different people, glass artist, a wood artist, 
both of those are kaleidoscope makers and then some metal artists put that together. So it's got wings that flap, so when you turn the cell of the scope, it actually moves the wings. So it's cool. It took a year to create. The woman who originally bought the piece passed away, so the store bought it back. Even if you don't buy a kaleidoscope, you won't walk out of Nellie Bly empty-handed. They can come in here and we can take their photograph through a kaleidoscope so they can have a bit of a kaleidoscope experience and go home with a souvenir. A selfie in optics and artistry. They just think they're cool. I mean, they're colorful and it's art that has motion as opposed to Picasso that just sits on the wall. You know, it's never ending and you're always gonna get something different. Sorry, Pablo. That's one point of view that's hard to argue. Welcome to the Clink Scale, a reimagined boutique hotel bar and grill, all in one historic building. It was built in 1899. It was originally high-end offices upstairs, your attorney, your dentist, your real estate broker, and downstairs was uh, retail stores. Um, and so if you look at the facade of the building, it still says Clink Scale 1899, and that was the original owner's name who built the building as an investment. While fully revamped and modernized, owner Eric Jurison says it was important to embrace the building's original character. It's a great building, so it was super easy to go in here and, and just gut it, restore it, and, and start from the, the ground up. So, you know, from the flooring, electrical, plumbing, putting sprinkler system through the building. We converted the upstairs from eight rooms with shared bathrooms now to, to six rooms with their own bathrooms all done in marble and subway tile. Each room is simply, yet elegantly decorated, charming, airy, and intimate. Black and white with splashes of color, king or queen iron beds, hardwood floors, and a refreshed hallway guides you from the street level up to your room. Even the Clink Scale's cocktail menu reflects the theme of updating an old building. Everything's now back to classic cocktails, you know, people aren't drinking as much, they want the quality. So we're infusing a lot of our bourbons with, or vodkas, or, or even gin's quite popular now, and from foam. But if you look at our, our menu from a Harvey Wallbanger um, to the Manhattan, we got some classics there with some interesting twists. Like the Arizona Mojito, your usual rum and mint with a surprise of prickly pear syrup, and the Mingus Fog, Irish coffee made with house-infused cinnamon whiskey and Baileys, topped with cream and fresh shaved chocolate. Another surprise, unlike most restaurants in town, you don't have to wait for a table. There's only 13 tables and most of the people that are dining here probably half are staying in town. Um, there's a few locals, but most of them come from down the hill, and if we're asking them to drive over from Sedona, we shouldn't probably make them wait an hour for a table. Um, so it was kind of a way of saying, hey, if you're willing to drive to Jerome instead of Old Town, um, it's a little farther, but you don't have to wait. We'll give you a reservation. Old Town Cottonwood is where Eric and his wife have another hotel and a handful of restaurants. But Jerome is where they opened their first, the haunted hamburger and grapes. It was kind of fun. We hadn't done anything in Jerome since Grapes, which was, you know, 20-some years ago. So to actually do a project in town felt like kind of coming home. It's not that we're not up here every day, because we are. But to, to do another restaurant, certainly, was there were some definite deja vus. And the clink scale, while shiny and new, feels like it's been here all along. Is the haunted hamburger really haunted? <laughs> Eric still has a few of his own ghost stories to share with us, plus tales from another hotel where thousands have checked in, but some have never left. <laughs> <laughs>